Jerry crunches out under a quarter moon. He carries a crowbar and rope wound around his body. He walks like a man up to no good at all. Natty crunches out. Young Natty, who's been wondering for a while now what Dad does on those nights he ain't home in his bed. The graveyard beyond the walls where the spy, John Barsad, rests in his long home. And Natty Cruncher hides in the bushes watching Dad and the two fellows who joined him at their work. Hold on. We're there. Give it a scrape. Come on, boys. You don't have me fit for lunch. He ain't hungry. <laughs> Let's have him up. Natty worms forward. Half of him has to see this, and the other half would do anything not to. What? <laughs> what have I got here? Dad! Dad! A rat. Is it a little rat in the bushes? No, Dad, it's me. It's Natty, honestly, it is. I know, so it is, boy. I was a speaking metaphorically. Like, you was acting like a rat to see. I just wanted to know, Dad, that's all. I wanted... I wanted... To help you, so I did. Does ya? Well, you, you know what help me right now is that when we take the gent residing in this here coffin out of it, we put you in it and nails down the lid so you keep your mouth shut forever. Open it up, boys. No, Dad, no, please, Dad. I swear, never a word. I just wanted, please, Dad, please. I'll never tell. Never, never. You'll still be fresh in there and a grinning like the devil himself. I don't want to see Dad. I don't. I don't. Right, hold on, boys. Now, listen to me, Natty Cruncher. Tonight is the night you growed up. You're a man now and have to take this world like a man. You wants to help me in the resurrecting business? Yes, Dad. Because there's no backing out once you're in. Unlike the grave, eh, hey, boys? <laughs> I wants to help you, Dad. Honest. Well, honest ain't perhaps the word I'd use, but... Straight. Are you straight, Natty Cruncher? I'm straight. Because there's good money to be made. Doctors will pay for fresh. And I like to say there's none fresher than Jerry Cruncher's. And... So... Is it to be Cruncher and Son? It is, Dad. Cruncher and Son. Then stand straight and stare death in the face. Because we're all partners now. All right, boys. <laughs> well, I'll be double damned and dragged to hell. You cunning bastard. As Jerry swears at the untenanted coffin as Mr. Charles Darnay visits Miss Lucy Manette. A great pleasure to both of them. Miss Manette, I hope I do not intrude. Mr. Darnay, of course you do not. You did say I should call when I pleased, Miss Manette. And I am pleased, Mr. Darnay, that you are pleased. <laughs> now I... May I take the great liberty of calling you... I was you beginning to think you never would, Charles. Lucy, you are the most... As Mr. Sidney Cotton visits his regrets via the bottle, then in that other city of Paris, a recently deceased gent in the import-export business visits a wine shop in pursuit of his business of importing and exporting information. Ah, good day to you, monsieur. Is it a good day? For a glass of cool wine, why not? They tell me you sell a very cool wine, my friend. But I'm no friend of yours, I believe. John Barsad, it seems, is in the freelance business these days, importing and exporting whatever he may find for whatever he may earn. <sighs> That's good wine. Has the sun in it. Then I suggest you drink it, pay and go. Listen, Defarge. How do you know my name? It's my business to know names. Just as it's my business to know things that others don't know. And is it your business to take chances with your life? Oh, they come and go lives. Like information. I hear, for instance, 
And you have an interest in the sad case of one Gaspard, who was lately found and executed for the act of killing the Marquis St. Evremond. You know of this? What do you know? I know the man Gaspard died for his act. I say, yes. Yeah. I say he acted as a father might act when such a crime was committed by such a man as St. Evremond. Words are cheap. <laughs> that is true. You are a philosopher. And as such, you will know that truth does not come for pennies. And sentiments like yours are written by children in their school books. Drink your wine. Dr. Manette. The good doctor stayed here after he was released. So? His daughter and a fat businessman came to collect him some years ago. So? So you have not heard of them since, or how they fare in London? Nor do we care to. If you have something to say, say it like an honest man. Even if it were to your advantage to know how it goes over there? How could that be? Place 20 francs between us on this table. I will tell you what I know. If you think it nothing, take your money back. If you think it worth something, then I will pick up that coin and you will have a friend in future. You're a fool if you think of that much money to waste. Look at this place. I would be a fool if I didn't know that you, Citizen Defarge, and you too, madame, are part of a very secret organisation dedicated to the brotherhood of all men and the overthrow of... You have funds for this sort of... Do you know what you are feeling on the back of your neck at this moment? Hmm? Do you think a knitting needle is merely a tool for making scarves and stockings? One push, and the point will be deep in your brain. You will be dead before you can blink. And do you think the Everymont family is finished now, eh? <laughs> that you have done your work? Think again. <sighs> there is another. No. A nephew. He lives in England, works as a teacher of languages. He goes under the name of Darnay. Oh. And he is every bit as arrogant and cold and cunning as his uncle. And he is courting, I hear, the lovely daughter of an old friend of yours, Dr. Manette. What? Hardly credible is it that even a St. Evremond would have the gall to pay court to the daughter of a man his family imprisoned for 20 years. Darnay. Charles Darnay. It seems their crimes live on. The money is yours. Good day. Revenge. 20 francs and confirmation that Defarge really is a part of a conspiracy. A good day indeed for the import-export business. And his information is not wrong. As time passes, hearts grow fonder. And there is a boating party on the Thames. <coughs> We're never meant to be a sailor. Nonsense! Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Well, an admiral, perhaps. Just not in a very small boat. Oh, Charles, Charles, oh. the oars! Useful tools, though they be. Are floating away, Crummer. So they are. Goodness me. You do not seem perturbed. I have no doubt our friends will come to our aid. I believe I see Miss Pross leaping onto a boat with Mr. Lorry, poor soul, even now. And... Meanwhile, Lucy. Yes, Charles. I would like to take this opportunity. These, these few quiet moments. We have had many quiet moments in the last months, Charles, and I bless the memory of them. <laughs> they have meant um, your your visits, our times. Yeah, together. they have meant a lot to me too, Lucy. Ever since. Uh, it's a terrible way to begin the thing with ever since. <sighs> ever since that first day I saw you on the ship from France and then in that dreadful courtroom, seeing you there, yes, yeah, seeing you there was... was. <sighs> I remember how I felt when they were questioning me and that dreadful spy who... Lied and lied. Then I remember... Lucy, oh. this is my speech, oh. if you don't mind. Of course not, please. But go on. I... I... You see, ever since... Oh. You're not usually tongue-tied, Charles. 
Why, I remember when you started visiting after the trial, we could hardly stop you talking. <laughs> Poor old Pross would be glaring in through the door, and Father would be yawning away, and you just went on. And <laughs> <laughs> Such wonderful stories, and I was always so... Uh, but of course, you must say... You see, you Lucy, you must know what I am. I mean, where I come from, came from. It isn't easy to for you... All the times we've spent together, times that for me have meant more than other times we have not been together. Oh, that is sad stuff. I want my words to fly Stand like eagles and yet struggle no like chickens. Our friends would have rescued us soon, Charles. What I'm trying to say, Lucy, I... I... In my way, no, in any way, I have, I have, I have. Yes, Charles, with all my heart, I will be your wife. That is what you are going to ask, isn't it? Oh, my dear love. I am so happy. I am so happy. This is the best day of my life. Whoa. Laurie! Pross! My friends! What wonderful news! Whoa. We are to be married! We are to be married! Whoa. Lucy, my love! Oh, oh, oh. oh. I give you charm and charm! Hope it to my lady bed of the river! Sailor's promise. Not to mention that the tent is no better than a sewer. Come to think of it, it is a sewer. Brass! I am so happy I can kiss you here and now! <laughs> the news is published, the bands are read, and of course, noticed by those who have reason to notice. In a shabby room in the temple, a once promising lawyer peers into the mirror of his glass. My witness, I believe. Splendid. Now, Mr. Carton. I am at your service. Indeed, sir. I believe you are at the service of any man who can provide a bottle. There are worse things to work for. And better. Mr. Carton, three months ago, on hearing an article of news... I believe you took steps to ensure that certain events did not, as a consequence, occur. Am I right? I did my best to ensure Striver didn't deliver his offer of marriage to Miss Minette, yes. Why? I thought it an unsuitable offer. For him or for her? For her, of course. Thank you. Now, I believe, Mr. Carton... You've gone on record a number of times as maintaining you do not give a damn for anything at all on this earth. Is that so? Answer clearly so the jury can hear. I have. Then why? I beg your pardon? Why did you care what was suitable for Miss Manette? Come, come, sir. The question is clear enough. Surely for a man of your supposed ability. Here we come to it at last. I... Striver is... We are not talking about Mr. Striver. We are talking about Lucy Manette. I did not. I did not. She is... A golden-haired doll. Did you not call her once? I ask you again. Why do you care? Because... She is worth something. Even you must be able to see that. Laurie, the, the businessman, cares about profit and loss, ledgers, but she's changed him. And Mr. Laurie has a connection with her father, Dr. Manette. You do not. You merely happen to look almost exactly like the man she's going to marry. Stop it. That's enough. This is a court of law. It's no place for stop it. That's enough. Here, sir. Our job is to come at the truth. Root it out wherever it hides. Now, you say she changes people. Do you not mean she changed you? 
Clearly, please. He pauses for a long, long moment, then... Yes, I do. Do you not mean she made you care about her? Yes, I do. So you have feelings for her? Yes, I do. Would the witness go as far as to admit that he loves her? Yes, I do. And does the witness have any idea how ridiculous a spectacle he is making of himself? Yes, I do. And is he aware that had he given a damn, had he tried to work to achieve something, anything, in this world, rather than surrender himself to a repulsive course of weak-minded self-pity and drink, that had he made one jot of effort, he might have stood beside Miss Manette as her husband and lover? Do you have anything at all to say, Mr. Carton? Anything? Nothing? Then it is nothing. And dawns the wedding day, and all is... Careful in the kitchen, you lubbers. Don't you be denting the dishes, or I'll have your gizzards for garters. Oh, good day, Miss Pross. <laughs> Why, you're looking quite flustered, Miss Pross. Oh, that ain't the half of it. Getting married is no joke, I can tell you. Well, you were married yourself, Miss Pross. Wouldn't catch Pross being legs in a bed for no belly ruffian. No, I was talking... No, figuratively of Miss Lucy. Oh, my ladybird. My sweetness. To yeah. <laughs> think all those years ago when I brought that tiny baby to these shores. Such a baby. Such years. To come to such a day as this. <laughs> Miss Pross, is that a tear I see in your eye? Pross, don't cry. If anyone here has dog soup in the eye, it's you. I, my dear Pross, shed a tear. Why, such a thing from a 30-year man at Telson Bank was never heard of in this world. <laughs> Lend us the white, will you? Silver needs a polish. Oh, uh, <laughs> and who would blame you, Cully, considering the gift you gave him? Why, more silver plates and knives and forks than I ever saw in my whole it's life. A small enough thing. But it does make me think, dear Pross that there might have been a Mrs. Lorry these 40 years almost. Uh, may I... Uh... Never in this world. You was born to Bachelor's Hall, so you was. A... Oh, my sweetness. Oh. Give me the wipe. <laughs> Don't you look a picture. Oh, Pross. Pross. Dear Pross. <laughs> Now, don't you cry, Pross. Pross, don't cry. Oh, well, you'll start me. My lord. <laughs> Lucy Manette, what a day this is. I I never had a daughter, but if I did... Uh, you have better. You have me. And I shall always... <laughs> oh, the wonderful <laughs> sweetness. You don't want a damp corsage, now, do you? Here, have a blow on this. <laughs> uh, yes. Ah, yes, indeed. But some tears are worth shedding. True, my dear. Charles Darnay is a lucky man. Is he still with father? Hmm? They locked themselves away half an hour ago, I hope. Don't you fret. <sighs> nothing is going to... What is it? Oh, nothing. Ross, nothing at all. I'm sure it was only a young man talking with his future father-in-law. No more than that. Advice. Encouragement. They stand, the three of them, waiting as Charles Darnay and Dr. Manette come out from their shuttered room. Father. The doctor is pale, pale as a new tombstone, and his face has about as much expression as does the slab. Charles Darnay, too. If he's pulled any renegado moves, I'll have his pee go out by the roots, so I will. Is still, still as laying water, and as deep. And they all five stand caught in silence. Caught out of time and place. My dear child, why so sad? This is the happiest day of our lives. Hey, Charles. That is the very happiest. Stand to Jack Adams. Huh? Well, so it is, so it is. <laughs> Pross, a bumper for all. We'll drink a toast and then it's off to the church. My friends, take your glasses. I say a toast to Mr. and Mrs. Charles Darnay. Mr. Mr. and Mrs. 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 Charles, Charles Darnay. <laughs> and God bless all who sail in her. <laughs> Who gives this woman? I do. 
It is a quiet service, a small group. And after, as they stand in the sunshine, waiting for the coach that will bear Mr. and Mrs. Darnay away on their honeymoon, a figure watches from the churchyard. A figure who might almost be standing beside the radiant bride, instead of standing in shadow, watching, watching, feeling. No pain now? No, of course, no pain. For he cares not one damn for anything in this old, cold world of ours. Father, be well. Be safe. I love you. Go, my dears. Go and be happy. God bless you, Lady Bird. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Laurie. Cross. Take care of the church, God bless you. God bless you both. Well, they're fairly away now. Aye. First stop, fumble at all. Here, what about the doctor then? What are you saying, Pross? You've got goggles in your head. After he come out of that room, he was looking just about like the mopus he was when he come out that room in France. And he ain't looking much better now. I, I was always concerned at the effect the marriage might have on him, but... There's something else here. Aye. Something Mr. Charles Crepo said to him in that room. Something that... Changed him. Manette, my friend, mm. do you go home with Pross and I will call by later. We'll have supper, eh? Two old fellows together. <laughs> I must go by the bank first. Some business. Yes. Yes, of course, my friend. Why not? We'll have supper. Yes. <laughs> He's got the collie models, Cully, so don't you belong about it, neither. Trust me, I will not. And let us hope. Let us hope. Okay. How long? Since we come back. He went up to the attic. I wait down here and... Four hours. Give or take. God help us. I wish we'd thrown the bloody bench and the tools out too, Cully. Have you been in? Of course I've been in. Does he know you? What he knows right now, apart from bloody shoes, ain't no more than three skips of a louse. Nothing. Are you sure, Pross? You think I'd lie with the latch here about that? No, 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 of course not. I'm sorry. Pross, no one must know. Especially not Lucy and Charles. I'm no gooseberry. Not a word I'll say. Keep him close, right? And pray he comes out of it before they come home. You reckon he will? We can only wait. And pray that he does. <laughs> Old friend. Do you know me? Look at me. In the light here. Manette. Do you not know me? 105 North Tower. 105 North Tower. 105 North Tower. Come along now. You must eat something. Can't be making them shoes without you eat something. It is a young lady's walking shoe. I should have finished it long ago. Then you'll need your soup, won't you? So be a good gentleman and let Prof spoon it in. Mm. Mm. It's breakfast time, old friend. Will you join us for breakfast? Dinner, Doctor. Mm. Dinner. Luncheon, old friend. A fine sea pie. Breakfast, Dr. Manette. Coffee, sweet black mm. coffee. Coffee, Miss Pross? Of course there's coffee for breakfast. Why would you ever need to tell me that? More toast. No, no, thank you, Laurie. Then... I wonder if I might trouble you. Hmm? Some advice, medical, concerning an old friend. Of course. 
You see, it is um, mental, yes, of the mind. Be particular. Precise. The, these matters... Oh, of course. It is the case of a shock under which the sufferer was borne down for... Well, I, I think he cannot say for how long, you see. A shock from which he recovered, by and by, over some months. Again, I am not certain how much he is aware, only that... At a certain point, there he was again, so to speak. His intelligence questing again, as once it did. And the lost time? Well, well, still lost, but, you see, not lost. There was, how should one say it, um, a relapse? How long? Nine days and nights. So long? Yes. And he was uh, as he was before. Uh, and is there family? Do, do they... No, nothing. It has been kept from them. That was very kind. No, <laughs> I'm a man of business. All this stuff of the mind is beyond me. I need guidance, and I can think of no man better qualified to give me that guidance than yourself. How does this relapse come about? Is there danger of it happening again? Can we do anything... To prevent that. I think it probable this relapse was not unforeseen by the subject. Was it dreaded by him? Very much so. Was it preventable? If perhaps he could have shared that dread? I, I, I'm afraid I must doubt it. I, I think there was an attempt to prepare himself, but perhaps that made it all the more likely. Some revival of things lost... Forgotten. Old fears and pains. The past rising up. Does he remember anything? Uh, nothing. And the future? As to that? We may hope that things being said, things being settled, there may be no more relapses. That is good comfort. Now, there is <clears throat> one more... Question. Yes, uh, I think I know what that will be. I ask a lot. Will you help me further? I will. You see, my friend had about him um, a bench, say, at which he worked when in that lost time. A bench and tools of a trade. Would it not be better if that were done with? Gone. Burnt and forever lost. Oh. 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 There it goes. And may it all be used up down to the squeak, as my brother would say. I thought your brother's... Other brother. This one's a pork butcher. Oh. Did you... His tools? I gave them to a deserving cause. Don't you fret on it. It is a good thing, isn't it? Right now, he's looking down as a chip cat. I think it's the only thing, Pross. And I hope it may save him. Sparks rise in the gathering gloom of night. Bright, dancing, dangerous sparks from the shoemaker's bench. Sparks that carry the imprint of many a shoe made painstakingly upon this wood over many a year. Sparks that carry and fly in the darkness. Carry and ignite in other places in times to come. A street, perhaps, in Paris. Quiet? Empty? Is everyone in the wine shop drinking after a hard day's work, or is something else afoot? Footsteps of a man, of a woman, husband and wife, walking with a purpose, walking towards something, walking away from something, years of oppression, of cruelty, of unbearable taxation, years of being under the heel. Now they are walking, two more, and two more, walking towards something, a symbol of all that has weighed down on them these centuries, towards a prison, a great dull stone face closed against a world of light and life, a cold, 
damned world of darkness that has clamped bands of iron round the hopes and dreams of France. But not this night. This night, as more and more walk with their torches held high, lights streams out upon this vast organ of undiscriminating pain and punishment. Men, women, children, dozens, hundreds, now thousands walking, serious intent on serious business, ready to tear the dark secret heart of the old order apart with their own bare hands. Friends! Citizens! Shall we die like sheep bleating for mercy where there is no mercy, only the knife? I tell you, the hour is come. The hour when we shall face those who oppress us. Before us, there is only death or freedom. This is our time, citizens. I say, to arms! Citizens, to arms! To arms! Such is the color of hope. Nothing can stand against the storm of history coming down upon this night. And it is done. And what seemed so solid was no more than the parchment upon which a hand might inscribe liberty, equality, brotherhood. You! You work here. You were warder. Yes, uh, uh, 105, uh, North Tower. I, I don't understand. Cell number 105 in the North Tower. It is quite clear, is it not? Uh, yes. Uh, hmm? uh, y- yes, citizen. Yes. Then take us there, citizen. Uh, uh, of course, of, of course. Come, come. Oh, I don't know what her is. Should we be wasting our time with this? There are more important things to be done. Here they found the magistrate, Fulo. He told the starving to eat grass. Now he will answer for it. Hilang, hello, Lang. I want to be there to see his face. Our comrades will do the job. The vengeance. That woman has been waiting as long as we have, as long as France for her time. They will not escape. But this one may if we do not act. This one in particular? You have to ask. No, but I'm concerned, Therese. What we're doing is about far more than us. It's about strength, equality and justice. Up here, citizens. And do all of these not begin in the unjust suffering of one? The farce of everything we are doing here is not about you and me and our children and brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and friends. Then it is about nothing. Look at me. Look into my face. Remember the girl you found. Remember what she had seen and suffered. Remember the old man, your friend. Remember what he had seen and suffered. Is that to be given away for a slogan? Citizens, we are almost there. Please. There. There it is. Cell 105 North Tower. It is empty now. They they are all empty now. You go first, citizen. This was your kingdom. Show us around, why not? Give us the guided tour. Visit Versailles. Visit the Bastille. Madame, it's... Citizen. The The torch. Pass it along the walls. Yes? Keep going. Keep going. Stop. Hold it there. It's initial scraped into the stone. A.M. Alexandra Manette. You see? It is one man, always one man or woman or child yeah. at the very point of the dagger. There's more? A poor doctor. Yes, yes. Indeed. Now! Is it loose? Yeah. It's just flour and water. Oh. Yes? Yes. I have it. Citizens, we must go. Look, look at the bars, look at the light. They are burning the building. We are burning your building. I I only meant... uh, I work here, that is all, for my family. You work here, that is all. Surely that is far from all. You shut the doors, you turn the locks. It would have been another if it had not been I, citizen. Then it would have been another's lot to die, citizen. No, please, you can't. Citizen... Tell her, it, it is wrong. I am just a man, like you. And yet you are well-fed and well-dressed. Why, man, you have a shine to you like a pork I like to market. You have children? Three. A, a boy of twelve, two girls of nine. Oh, the pride of my life, citizen. Are they beautiful, your children, citizen? So beautiful. 
Are they well fed, your children? Well dressed? Do they learn their letters and their numbers? Do they go out with Papa and Mama to see the sights? Do they laugh, your children? Oh, if you could see them, citizen. If you could hear them as they play. And, oh, God. The sound of children laughing. Ah, yes. I have heard of that sound. But as for hearing that sound... Without me, they will be lost. Do they love their father? Oh, of course, of course. Then perhaps. Just perhaps. God bless you, citizen. They will feel for a moment the pain the people have felt forever. You cannot... You are dying, citizen. Nothing can stop the blood now. You see how it catches the torchlight. You will never see your children again in this world. God help me! And there is only one world, citizen. And that world is this. And in this world's tomorrow, I shall be certain to find out where you live. No, no, no. And pay your little lambs a visit. And believe me, there will be blood. I think we're done here. Yet men and women must sleep and eat and go to their homes and sit and talk amongst themselves. Poor suppers, perhaps, and poor homes. Yet hope and human fellowship has struck sparks from each. For something is growing here. A tree that grew deep in a wood, cut down, saw, smooth with adze and plane, measured with skill, fixed with bolts and pins, built up, joined with iron and steel and rope until... Give her a try. Let her go. Let her go. That's it then. She goes. I'll lay the gear team. And in the wine shop, it has come at last. Almost. It is almost here. In London, life goes on sweetly for the newly married couple. It is almost as if nothing could disturb the balance of their days. Except perhaps the footsteps of the future. The other lives that will, will they, nil they, rush down upon their tranquil times. Sweetness, there's a fella downstairs wants to see you. Someone we know, Cross? In a manner of speaking. The Luppy from the Bailey. Cross? Fella was half seas over, that fella. The ensign bearer. Oh, Mr. Carton. I wish you'd say what you mean at once, Cross. Is he... Looks straight as a butter bag to me. <laughs> Least I couldn't smell nothing. Then please send him up. All right, you can come in. Oh, he was outside the door, Cross. <sighs> Mr. Carton, do come in. I, um, uh... Please, Miss... <laughs> Mrs. Darley, I am indeed as sober as a Dutchman. You have no need to worry. Sir, I can assure you, I never... Please, do sit down. Pross, um, may we have tea? Hmm. Pross, please go down to the kitchen and make tea for us. Very well. I seem to recall you are fond of tea, Mr. Carton. Yes, tea indeed. Mrs. Darney. I... I was at your wedding. Huh? No, 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 you did not see me. I thought it best. Huh. Well, but I wanted to come and give you joy of the occasion. Yes, you and your husband. To wish you joy and all happiness. That is very kind of you, sir. I owe you twice now. Twice? Yeah, for saving dear Charles and for your very good wishes. Well... The saving was the chance of nature and the wishes. Why, words are as cheap as good intentions, so you see you owe me nothing at all. Mr. Carton, may I take the liberty? Please, Mrs. Darnay. You do not seem to consider yourself as of any account in this world. That is, of course, you're right. But 
I do owe you something, and I would ask you not to hold my opinion as of no matter. Oh, forgive me, it was... It has become something of a habit with me, this... Uh, oh, it's of no account. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Don't apologise, Mr. Carton. I am glad to see you here. I am happy to serve you tea. Happier, I think, than you are to drink it, if we are being honest with each other. If we are. And I see no reason why we should not be. Honest? Friends. We have only a small circle, Charles and I. And I believe Mr. Lorry holds you in some esteem. He has said so more than once in this room. You do me altogether too much honour, Mrs. Well, there you Darling. are again. <laughs> <laughs> then I might perhaps visit you sometimes. Mm. It would make me very happy to be of any service to you at any time. Yes, if... Well, you could feel you might call on me. Yes, that would... If it is not too absurd. Of course it is not. <laughs> then I shall detain you no longer, Mrs. Darnay. You have made me feel that perhaps I may one day be of some account, or at least some use in this world after all. Mm. But now... Tea is served. I really must... I didn't go to the trouble of making this dish of tea for Greenbug here to lay his legs round his neck and scarf up. You see, now you are truly a friend of the house, Mr. Carton. Pross likes you. Does she? Do I, sweetness? So you simply must have a cup of tea. Mrs. Darnay, it will be a great pleasure. Lucy. Lucy, my love. I have received... Oh, I, I did not know you had a guest. Charles, you remember Mr. Carton? Yes, hello, Carton. Mr. Darnay. I came to offer you joy of your wedding. Thank you, sir, but if you will excuse me, important family matters intervene. Of course, I will not intrude. Mrs. Darnay. What about my tea? It ain't dog's water, you know. There's expensive leaves it. I'll see him out. Come on, come on. What is it, Charles? From France. A letter, my uncle's old steward. He, he was left in charge of the estate. But will you refuse to take any part of your inheritance? I did, but Gabelle is in trouble with the Revolutionary Court. But it is France. He begs for my help, Lucy. I cannot refuse. But what can you do, my love? I can go to him. I must go to him. Oh. <laughs> In A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens... Lucy is played by Lydia Wilson. Carton by Paul Reddy. Charles Darnay by Andrew Scott. Miss Pross by Alison Stedman. Dr. Manette by Carl Johnson. And Jarvis Laurie by Jonathan Coy. Defarge is James Laley. Madame Defarge, Tracy Wiles. Jerry, Carl Prekop. Natty, Daniel Cooper. And Barsad, Gerard McDermott. Charles Dickens is Robert Lindsay and other parts are played by Adam Billington and Simon Bubb. The music is by Leonard Bush. The Tale of Two Cities is dramatized by Mike Walker and directed by Jeremy Mortimer and Jessica Dromgoole.